On the right hand side, you can actually see the screenshot of the Clicks browser, which is actually based on Firefox code base. Uh, but what it differs in reality is that we have our own search technology, which powers the search. What we actually believe in is the browsers can be intelligent enough, which can actually understand user queries or the natural language queries and suggest pages right there and then in the suggestion box. And that's what we at Clicks really figured out. Uh, there are two other logos on the screen, which is Mozilla and Ghostry, and a little story behind it. So we were able to convince Mozilla, who is the makers of Firefox, that this is what the future of browsers which look like. And Mozilla actually invested in Clicks uh, last year, and we will be into course touch technology very soon. And Ghostry, it's another brand name uh, which people might know about, uh, especially if they are really into anti-tracking and uh, understanding how online tracking works. Uh, it's something which we bought recently as well, uh, which now gives us access to a lot of, uh, say, a million users globally, um, which actually allows us to integrate their technology into our browsers. So if the primary functions that I could actually discuss, what our browsers allow you to actually get, is not only web search, but the live news, anti-tracking, anti-phishing, ad blocking, and now Ghostry included. We are available on Windows and Mac OS on desktop and also uh, Google Play and App Store on the mobile version. Uh, about the team itself, we are really an international team of like say 125 different experts from 32 different countries. And we are of course hiring. So if you are also interested in uh, joining the same mission regarding privacy centric browser browsing and you are into browser developments or front end engineering or even back end uh, development dealing with large scale data sets or machine learning, do look at clicks.com. So what does search at clicks look like? looks like? So as I said, it's an in-browser search, uh, which means that if I type a query like Python programming wiki, my browser itself gives me the suggestions of the uh, links which are directly related to it. Uh, I was in Rocklaw recently, and I actually just wanted to check the weather for that week. And as I type weather in Rocklaw, I can actually get the information about the hole in my address bar itself. Similarly, for uh, searching any news, uh, I can actually just look up the current news based on the domain itself, and my browser can tell me exactly how uh, the recent news are. Now, let's see how it looks like in, in practice. So the first thing I actually uh, searched for on, on Clicks Browser, this is the Clicks Browser, and it's real life, um, that what are the places to visit in Warsaw? And I got this result. And these are the sort of results which come from our uh, human web, which is like an index that we collect regarding which are the pages that people often visit given these searches. And as you can make out, this is a huge index comprising of different queries. Now, since this is a German uh, backend for the search that I'm using, uh, I actually get a German result first. But since the query was made in English, I also get results in English. Uh, and it is not only up to this. So you might actually complain that why do you search for weather in Rocklaw when you are in Warsaw? So let's do that. So yeah, so today is 21 degrees and it's sunny. And tomorrow it's going to be raining. So take your umbrellas tomorrow, OK? Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, how what search at clicks looks like. Um, and in general, before I explain how we actually put deep learning into web search, I would like to explain to you how search actually works. Uh, so if you call traditional search, or what search engines do lately, uh, is they actually create a vector space of the query and the documents that are in question. And there is a metric which is very famous called TF-IDF, which is also like a baseline metric for text processing. Um, and apart from that, if you can just want to think about what could be the right document given a query, you just want to search for whether those query terms actually are in the browser. Uh, in the document. So the aim is actually, if you have a lot of documents, given a user query, give me the best candidate documents from that index which satisfy the query itself. And that is the whole aim around search in general. You plug search into any application, that's what the objective is. If you plug search into a web scale search engine, the index size grows tremendously. And that is the scale of the problem itself. At Clicks, we thought that we could do this slightly differently. So usually, a traditional search engine has an index of all the web pages and the content within it. We thought 
we could actually leverage something which is much more readily available and a lot cheaper, and that is query logs. So at Clicks, what we do is we have an index of query logs where each query is sort of mapped with what are the URLs which the people actually go to. Uh, to translate that, for example, if I'm typing FB, most of the times people want to end up at facebook.com. And if you have an index of such queries and URL mappings, you can actually estimate in real time what could be the possible destination the user wants to go in. And believe it or not, you can actually collect this data very, very easily in a very uh, sort of privacy-centric way as well. And this is what we have achieved. So what we want to do at Clicks, when a user query comes to the browser, we want to match it in real time with all the queries that are available, either on a keyword level or using some other method, which I will discuss next, and give the appropriate pages which are there in the index. And this is what the index actually looks like. So you have query and URL IDs. So IDs are actually hashes, which sort of map to the URL in general. When we talk about search, we actually have two very important topics within it. So when a user query comes to the browser, the search engine actually first expands that query into different versions of the query. And this, these different versions of the query are actually then triggered in parallel to the search engine. And the first step, it's called recall, where we want to get the best candidate pages that are available in our index, which is possible. So the best candidate pages could be, say, 10,000 pages in, say, billions of documents that you have. So the recall step ensures that you get those 10,000 pages in the least amount of time. When I call about time, I call about latency. And latency is a huge problem for search engineers. When I say huge problem, the latency budget for search engineers is, standard, is standardized between 50 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. Just consider a user experience where a person actually types a query, and he has to wait a minute to get results. So even if you have a super staggeringly smart AI system, or any system which takes like gives perfect results, but it takes a minute to compute, it's just not usable. And this is the biggest challenge in search, how to speed it up uh, in general so that people can get results quickly. So within those 300 milliseconds, say, the, the maximum that we can go to, we have to not only get pages from our index, but then also show the most relevant ones at the top three positions or top 10 positions. And this is done with a process called ranking. So the only problem with ranking is ranking takes into account a lot of signals, like the page information, the title, the URL, and all the other information that is associated with it. So we can't actually do process those 10,000 pages in real time within that time budget. We can do that, but it's just too slow. So what we have is a pre-rank function, which is used as pruning step to reduce that 10,000 results down to 100 candidate sets, which sort of gives us the best representation given the user query. And then the final ranking is actually applied on those 100 pages to get those top three. As you have seen, we have a very limited real estate around the Clicks browser itself as to how many search results you can show. So we are only focused on the top three results. But if you consider a conventional search engine as well, you are mostly concerned about the results that come on the first page and not on the recent other pages. And this is a very generic browsing behavior. If you consider 80% of your queries, they will land up on your first page, and that's it. That's what you care about. And we want to target those segments through our browser itself. So what you actually save is you do not actually have to go to a search engine page and look up results within it, because a search engine will directly give you where you want to go. So at clicks, the, the problem is like sort of uh, boiled down to, given a user query, find me the three best pages out of, say, two to three billion pages index. So where does deep learning enter into this? And I'll make a disclaimer here uh, that we have not yet achieved an AI system which sort of solves the holy grail problem of search. It's just one part of the system that we have developed, and it helps to improve the accuracy. So there is still some conventional search methodologies in place, but deep learning allows us to do, go one step further. So instead of representing queries at, as terms, we can actually represent queries as fixed dimensional vector of floating point values. So what does that actually mean? So let's say, who knows what is a vector space? Show of hands. Yeah. So for others, uh, vector space is something, for example, if you have a point in space, say in two dimension, you can actually represent this with x and y axes. So you have two points which sort of define that point in space. Now consider that you have 100 dimensions, and the point also represents 
say a concept, say a word or a query in space. And those 100 dimensions actually store meaningful information about that query or a word or an entity. And this is what we call distributed representation. So at Clix, we have queries which are defined over 100 dimensions. And we want to first learn word representations with a simple formula in mind, where words that appear in context share same semantic meaning. And the meaning of the query is defined by the floating point numbers in this distributed vector. How are these query vectors learned? Uh, so we employ a sort of a different technique to neural probabilistic language modeling. Uh, and I'll explain to you the next. And again, if I have to measure how two queries are now similar, I need to come up with a metric. So the metric that we use is something called cosine similarity. So now, instead of dealing with, say, OK, how many words in my query 1 matches the words in my query 2, I just look at, OK, given the query 1 vector and query 2 vector, what is the cosine similarity between the two? And this is what it looks like. So if you have a query like Sims game PC download, and I, have, uh, I give it to my system, the closest queries which come around looks like this. So on the left, you have all the queries. And on the right, you have all the cosine similarities. So on the right, it's the cosine distance, rather, because it's in increasing order. So the distance, the lower the, lower the distance, the closer the query is to the user query. What you actually see is the queries are bag of words oriented. Uh, so for example, the game PC Sims the or the Sims game PC uh, both could represent the same text. And this allows us to like store them much more efficiently. So you, you don't duplicate your data. And the system actually tells you, OK, the first query is really similar to your original query with this similarity. And this is a very unique system because you actually can see that the first query which comes in uh, represents a non-word-to-word -word match. So this means even if you have never seen the query before, we can still reply based on all the queries that are available just because of we know the representations actually are similar in vector space. So how does this happen? So this starts from analyzing words and their distribution. And the way we do it is we actually learn something called a distributed representation of that word. So we are using some unsupervised deep learning techniques uh, to learn these word representations. And what more precisely we want to learn is this relationship. So if I say I have two words, w and w dash, if I sort of take a difference between the two, it should signify some significant semantic meaning. What does that mean? So if I have words like king, man, and woman, it's a very famous example uh, from one of the papers. Uh, and I subtract the vector from, king, uh, from a man from king, and then add a vector to woman, I should get a vector which is closer to the word queen. And this is a very, very s huge uh, sort of relationship that you actually can extract just looking at the data or just looking at the corpus that you have. So in the first version that we released, and this example which came in uh, was actually described in a paper called word to vec by Thomas Mikulov. Uh, we had our first version based on it. And when Mikulov came up with the iteration of uh, how to improve the model even further, uh, he came up with an algorithm called FastX, which sort of outperforms word to vec for our extrinsic task. And so we got improvement in our recall by 1.5%. So we, are, we have recently switched to FastX. And I'll explain both of them, because that would make it clear for you. So as I said, uh, Mikulov in 2013 proposed this word to vec model. Uh, we have two different models within word to vec uh, First thing is continuous bag of words. The other one is continuous skip gram. Uh, and by the way, word to vec is also available uh, free online. Uh, you can actually go and run experiments if you want to try it out. Also, there's a library in Python. It's called Jensen, which also has a similar implementation. So again, uh, word to vec focuses on getting to learn these distributed representation of these words. And these are learned through neural networks. And again, since it, they are trained using neural networks, we apply stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation. So let's see what the two models look like. So for example, if I have a sentence uh, which has five words in it, uh, the first model that is continuous bag of words tries to predict the center word given all the words in context. The other model does the opposite. So if you have a center word, it can actually predict the words to the left and words to the right. And this is a very powerful model. You'll see why. Because what it actually learns in each of these cases is, given the context, what could be the probability of my word to appear there? Now, if you have two sentences, like, say, cat sits on the mat or dog sits on the mat, you know the first entity it has the same context. So of course, all these words which are appearing in the same context might signify a similar domain. 
And this is what the model actually learns very well. You will be surprised to know how good this model does for a lot of these relationships. So for example, cat and dog might come and classify in the same family of animals. Similarly, you can have different sort of relationships. It's not really defined how good these are, but given the examples and initial research around uh, the similarities, you'll find a lot of these relationships. And I'll show them uh, very soon. So what happens internally and how the learning actually happens? So sorry for the mathematics slide, but it is something which is very, very uh, important to understand how things really work internally. So these uh, neural probabilistic language models use something called a max maximum likelihood principle so that they can maximize these probabilities for the next word. So as you s have seen, like in both these examples of continuous bag of words and skip gram, what you actually have to do is given your history words or the words which are around the center word, we want to predict what is the probability of the next word or the center word or vice versa. So you can actually do that given this uh, softmax score, given the word in context and the history, what would be my probability? Now, if you have to like think about a problem as such, so for example, I have a word sequence like a cat sits on the, and then I want to predict the next word. What I actually want to do is given my entire vocabulary, I want to find out what could be the possible best next word given the, se the sequence. And that's a hard problem. Can, you, can any, anybody tell me why this is a hard problem? Uh, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, let's think about programming in general. What could be the problem around, say, I want to uh, find the next word given all my words in history or in my vocabulary. Okay, I'll simplify it. The, the problem is you want to get the probabilities, which is the last layer across all your words in dictionary. Now, if you, have, if you are dealing with web scale data sets, you might have dictionary vocabulary sizes in the order of millions. So for each word that you want to predict, you have to find this sort of a probability across all your words, and then do a sort of a priority queue based sort to get the maximum probability. And this is a very expensive step. And with languages and with data that sort of grows e over time, this becomes almost impossible to compute in real time. So what could be the alternative around this is using something called noise contrastive estimation or say negative sampling where we don't actually look at all the other words that are possible. We just look at some examples, which are say, I have some positive word, say I know uh, the cat sits on the mat is one positive example, but then I could pick some k random words from my index, which might not correspond to the sequence, which is like my noisy words. And then the classifier only has to determine what is given my positive word and given my negative words, how can I maximize the probability so that the positive word happens more than the negative words. So once you do that over and over again, you'll find a clear separation that the noisy words will sort of get suppressed and your most real contextual words get in like higher probability. Again, uh, if you have to understand this same principle, uh, this is defined by the for this equation uh, where you actually want to find the log probability uh, where d equals to one means the positive examples and given wt is the current word and history, I want to maximize the log probability of the first part and sort of minimize the log probability of the second part. And overall, I want to maximize this function. So what I want to do is, given all my negative examples, I want to suppress them so that their probability or joint probability becomes lower. And for the right word, that becomes higher. So each time I see a context, uh, the next word should be what the context actually says. And this, with all your examples, gets learned over time. And again, the objective is to maximize this uh, model. And this is way more faster because instead of dealing with, say, millions of words in the vocabulary, you just look at k different words plus the word of the positive sentence. And that's way more cheaper and much more compute friendly that you can actually compute in real time. So let's see how the learning actually works away from the mathematics in general. And I have a sentence like, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And I have a context which is defined as, say, window size of one. So just consider the first three words, the quick brown. Now, I have a center word quick, and I have a historical words as the and brown. So I have a context and a target word, and I want to predict the target. So skip gram actually inverts the context and targets. So what you actually want to do, so given the, 
and brown from quick, I want to predict the. So I want to predict if there is quick and brown, what is the probability of the? And similarly, what is the probability of brown given quick? So then I have an input-output pair, which I could give it to the model. So I have input as quick, I want to predict the. I have input as quick, I want to predict brown. And I can actually define this over the entire data set and optimize this uh, particular function. Or you can give it one by one, or you can give it in a batch. So let's now think about what could be the noisy examples. So let's say my number of noisy examples is one. So I want to pick one word at random, which makes this distribution uh, sort of noisy. So I take a unigram distribution and just select one word as sheep. So the possibility, which I actually want to compute, is now, uh, given the and quick, what is the probability of sheep and quick? And I want to maximize the probability of the first part than the other one, because sheep being quick is far less probable than the followed by quick. And once you maximize it across all these examples, across different iterations, using stochastic gradient descent, you can actually learn a function which maximizes this over your entire vocabulary. So as you know, uh, since it's an optimization problem, you want to, do, uh, to find the gradient. And the way you do it is you find the derivative. Uh, so you do the, this derivative with respect to your embedding parameters, and then you perform these updates to embeddings after each iteration. We repeat this process over your entire data sets, and what you learn is these embedding vectors where each word is represented by a fixed dimensional floating point vector. So this is what you actually get when you have to use word to vec and you get like a word level information. Now, what Mikolo actually did in his current work using fast text, he thought about something even greater. He thought about, okay, now my words depend on the other contextual words in the sequence. Can I actually do more? So the theory behind fast text is that don't look at word as words, but look them as subwords. So for example, if I have a word like phase, it can have an internal subword as as, and as itself is another word in English. So you can actually chunk down a word as a series of n-grams, and you can then compute a vector of the word by having a summation over all these n-gram vectors. So the scoring, scoring function is then defined as the summation over all the n-grams which the word is formed from. And this again represents the vector. Now why this is useful or like is important, so for example, if you see like in English, uh, you have similar linguistic features which come along. That is, uh, say, a word which ends in S or ES means it's a transition from singularity to plurality. And given any new word, given that suffix, you can actually just determine, okay, it means the plural form of that verb. So just given enough data, you can actually learn these patterns, say suffixes and prefixes. Uh, in language, uh, you actually have, in European language especially, you have these features which are far more stronger than English. And this is what we study in morphology, where the word actually gives you more information uh, just by looking at it. So you can actually understand what is the tense of the verb, what could be the, say, gender of the word, where, where it actually is used. And similarly, for singularity and plur pl plurality. So given this, you can also construct new vectors for new words because you know you can actually break the new word down to different pieces. So for example, at runtime, if I just want to know, given all my words that I've learned my vectors from, I just want to get a vector for a new word. But if I've never seen using word to vec I'll never be able to answer it. But with fast text, I could give an approximate sort of representation just by looking at all these subwords that I have. As I said, I'll give you a demo around uh, visualizing of these word vectors, and it looks like this. So if you project your word vectors, again, what the projection is uh, also done through an approximation, which is called TSNE, because our ve word vectors are sort of scattered in these 100 dimensions. And we want to project them into a space so that we can visualize it. It's very hard to sort of visualize a hyperspace. So um, Jeff Hinton actually came up with this method of reducing the subspace down to, say, two or three dimensions so that we can visualize them quickly. And if you see, uh, the, the sort of the vector representation of king and queen in space is actually close to what man and woman correspond. And this is just one representation. You can actually look at, say, different forms of the verb itself, like walking and walked, and swimming and swam. And similarly, not only that, you can also see uh, Spain and Madrid, the capital and country relationships. Now, just you can actually see it clearly why this is working in place. Now, if I have to say, uh, like the president of Germany is Angela Merkel. And suddenly I say the president of India is Pranam Mukherjee. 
The sentence structure around the names remain the same. So you can always come up with the same contextual information and get these meaningful entities. And this is what you get with word to word You actually learn the sequence. You actually learn where the position of those words are in the sequence. And if they are similar words, they will form in similar context. And that's where the learning happens. And again, if you again project it, it's a bit smaller. But you can actually see, like, at the, at the bottom, you can actually see all the characters coming together, because they are, like, always which come together. On the right side, it's, uh, you have the directions which also they are there. So left, right, east, east, west, they come far together. And you can actually see these clusters which form, like, uh, of similar meaning. By the way, it actually depends a lot on what your initial corpus was. So the corpus that we use, since we are using these for word sort of web-based search, is all our queries, all our uh, titles and description, entire Wikipedias. And this gives us a holistic view around what are the web comp like sort of corpuses that we have. And that the word vector learns pretty well. So it's highly dependent on what corpus you learn. For example, if you are learning word vectors on a financial domain, it will completely give completely different similar words than, say, a medical domain corpus. So it's highly domain dependent. So if you want to make it as general as possible, start using Wikipedias. If you want to make it more domain specific, you can use any domain corpus that you have. So as I said, uh, my word vector training using fast text gives me this vector, say 100, 100 values for each of the word in my query. Again, Sims game PC download. And this, these vectors actually then represent my word. Now, as I said, I want to get the query vectors or what could be the representation of this query in a vector form. Uh, so in search, one of the important things is uh, how much each term in the search query is important or is relevant. And this is something which we sort of compute using a metric called terms relevance. Now, why is this important? Like, for example, if I want to buy an iPhone or buy an Android phone, just one word difference in the both of these queries completely changes the results. So in one, iOS is the most dominating factor. The other, Android is. And that's why the dominating word in the query, even though I want to just buy a phone, is Android or iOS. And this is what terms relevance gives us. So we want to project these vectors in the space where these specific words within the query are given more weights. And we can do this using a heuristic function. So when I say it's a heuristic function, it is something which we can learn from data. And so if I could just throw out the output of what could be the term relevance for each of my terms that I see in the query, I can see, OK, Sims is, gets the highest uh, sort of relevance than the rest of these, because it's the name of the company or the name of the, uh, the game itself. Uh, I can, I'll just uh, throw away this thing quickly, because uh, I will explain you how this thing is computed internally as well. Uh, but again, it's a heuristic. So once you have these word vectors, and also you have these relevance weights, we can then average them uh, through something called a simple NumPy average. So I have these vectors from all the words in my query, and I have all the weights. So if I get an average or a weighted average representation, that weighted average representation gives me the representation of the query. So at the end, uh, the output of this function numpy.average is something which looks like this, which is like 100 values again for the vector, uh, for the query. And the dimensionality remains the same. So initially you had uh, word vectors with dimensionality of 100, which means 100 sort of floating point values in a list. And at the end, the query also is represented by the same. So basically what you have actually done is using the same space of where the vectors are actually learned, you have been able to successfully project your queries, which are like made up of multiple words. And they will also somehow capture all these semantic similarities. And that's what you actually get in the final system. A word on terms relevance and uh, what we use internally, uh, so it's like a heuristic metric. So what we have is, uh, for each word, we have different sort of statistics that we compute. We want to compute what is the frequency in the entire corpus, frequency of the documents where the word appear in, appears in, uh, the frequency in the top documents that are sort of attached to a query, uh, and again, top document, top two documents, top five documents. So what we use is uh, the metric called top five documents, where the frequency is, and then just divide by document frequency. Uh, we actually experimented with this a lot, that how do you actually get weighting better? And we found out if you normalize this across all your pages in the index, it sort of bumps up the score by around 1% or so. So we are using something called relative term relevance, where we actually multiply the first part with the log normalized value of number of pages versus uh, divided by the document frequency where the word appears in. And this gives us this cumulative number between, say, 0 and 1, which gives us how relevant that word is in the query. 
and it works surprisingly well. So as I said, now I have all the queries and I have all the vectors. How do I search my queries, which I'll say closest queries from? So I'll just explain to you with just telling you what the scale of the problem is. So if you have all your queries in your query index and you want to find out which is the nearest, say, 10 queries to my user query, how do you do it? Now, we cannot actually compute this over all our queries because all our queries are just too much. So we just thought, okay, we want to just pick the top queries per page given our index. So the top queries are like, say, top five queries which lead to a page. For example, say Facebook, FB, F is all, these are all top queries which link to facebook.com. And we just compute these query vectors for these, say, 800 million uh, queries. If you just compute those vectors with, say, query and a tab and then a vector and string format, this is 1.5 terabytes on disk. So how do you get similar queries from these 800 million queries? So you want to get 10 closest queries given your query index of 800 million queries and the vectors. So can you do brute force? Can you look at each query and do it sequentially, especially at runtime when you have a budget of 300 milliseconds? It's too slow. Can you, can you use some sort of a hashing technique? You can, but again, the quality of vectors do suffer. So the solution which actually required is, yes, we want to find a cosine similarity base metric, that if two queries are similar, I want to get a score which gives me a cosine similarity or cosine distance. It should scale up to 800 million queries and it should take 10 to 15 milliseconds or less. And that's the budget we work on. And the model which came to our rescue is something called approximate uh, nearest neighbor vector model. So when we built our system for the first time, we used a library called Enoy, which is actually used in production at Spotify and does help in uh, recommendations of uh, what could be the best music that you do. And it works on a similar principle. Uh, so we built uh, our, all our queries uh, and sort of build an Enoy model out of it. Uh, the problem with this approach is that even though we use one in production right now, where we sort of learn a single model for all our 800 million query vectors, it is just very sort of slow just to build because the number of queries are growing each time. And there will be a time where the building time itself takes long. We recently built one model which was like 1.6 billion query vectors, and it took six days on, say, a, a machine which had 128 cores. So the, in, the smartest way to actually like solve this problem quickly is to shard this data. But how do you actually compute shards on a vector space? So you can actually have a clustering algorithm which sort of clusters them into 10 different clusters and then look at one cluster based on the cluster center. Or if you want to avoid the step of clustering them, you can just divide your data set into 10 parts and look all, of, all 10 of them in parallel and then just compute uh, the top queries based on their similarity scores in a priority queue and just pick the top, say, 10 or 50. So as this is what we did uh, for our cluster setup is we just built 10 models. So each model got 80 million queries. Uh, and we got uh, we sort of had a configuration in Annoy with how, how many trees we are building. I'll explain this uh, very soon. Uh, so we used 10 for the cluster setup and 3 for the single machine, that is single model itself. And size of each model on disk was 40 GB per shard. Uh, and then if you compute like the overall model size for all these 10 models is like 400 gigs. And this is all is stored in RAM, by the way. So what we do is like at query time, we sort of query all these 10 shards, uh, get these nearest representations, say 50 from each one of them. So at the end, we have 500 queries. And then we do a sort based on cosine similarity to get these, say, top 55. So at clicks, we found 55 was a heuristically good number to actually utilize it. And we can fetch pages based on this. So once you get the closest queries, you can then from the index representation, I can get the pages which are associated with them. And this is how we do sort of improve upon our current recall step. Now, I have to tell you how NO actually works to really visualize this properly is, say if you have all these points where each point represents one query, and this is say boiled down to a two dimensional figure, and let's say it's a hyper hyperspace projection of these 100 dimensions. And if I have to say I have a user query vector, which is like, say, this corner one, and I want to find the nearest vectors around it, how would I find it, right? So how would I actually go about it? As I said, I can't actually go and brute force it. Like, uh, so each one of them, if I go and check distances with this current vector, it will be like too slow. And that is O of n. So to go 
say in sublinear time, you have to actually use uh, a structure which is called tree because trees are best used for log of n optimization or this uh, compute efficiency. So how do I build a tree out of this? So the first version that Anoy actually came up with, and it has, it has been changed now though, uh, was using a simple random split of the hyperspace. So if I just have to like pick two points in the space and I split it, I can actually get one split like this, say green and blue. If I do a split again within that subspace, I again can get these four subspaces. And suddenly I could see there is a structure which comes out. So even if I'm picking random points in space, I can still project them into different subspaces given those splits are random. And yeah, looking at that, we have say millions, hundred, hundreds of millions of vectors there. And you can see a binary tree starts appearing. If you keep splitting again and again within those subspaces, you get a tree structure like this. Now what's the beauty about this tree structure is it uses something called a binary tree partitioning in vector space. And the points which are actually closer within say each branch of the tree are actually closer in space because you made the split intentionally. Now you might argue uh, like how do you search for a point within this tree? So say I want, I have a point which is marked with red of X um, and I want to look for a point. So I just want to look at within that subspace which is actually marked with a triangle, what could be my corresponding nearest neighbors? Now depending on your spa so sparsity or like say not sparsity but uh, your denseness of your data. Uh, you might have a lot of points clustered together or you might have very few points nearest to your point. So you can actually just go to a branch and like pick one side of the branch and say, okay, these are my nearest neighbors because these form my nearest branch members. But this only gives me seven neighbors. I wanted 55 of them. So what should I do? Maintain a priority queue. Just traverse both sides which actually gives you maximum results till you reach your nearest neighbor count. So again, at query time, you can actually set this number of how many nearest neighbors do you want. And we'll keep looking at different sides of, these, uh, of the same tree branch. So again, you might argue that we just picked points at random, we made the splits, and we got nearest neighbors. What if I actually pick a point where the split where actually the nearest neighbors arrive are not in the right subspace, but towards the left or the right. So what you actually can do is you can actually train a forest of trees. So instead of a single tree, you can tra train multiple trees, which sort of capture these multiple representations and in search, not just train uh, like look up in one tree, but different trees. And if you see, we actually then learn like sort of forest of subspaces around the point and then compute nearest neighbors through that. So as I said, uh, since we, we deal with like millions and millions of words and it's like a, a huge problem to store them, like especially our index size grows. And so the scale of the problem is like if you have 100 dimensional uh, floating point values, that's like 400 bytes. And then you multiply with the number of queries, right? So 1.6 billion queries is like 640 gigs just like if you are storing just in raw floats, not even in strings. So that's a lot of, uh, say, data that you have to like save. Uh, so can you optimize it? And for that, we actually uh, use Kiwi. So Kiwi is something which is like a key value store. Uh, you can check out Kiwi.org if you have a similar use case, which we actually use uh, as an optimization step to sort of store our entire index data. Uh, and when I say optimization, it has a lot of optimization, say on keys. So you can actually st store all your keys as a try structure and do fast lookups. And then you can do compression by storing them in binary and also like doing a message pack compression on top of it. Now with vectors, we had a s very different problem where we actually had vectors which were like say stored as 32-bit precision floats. And that is a lot of say space that you actually store uh, just to store vectors. So what we found out that we can actually do away with some precision by sort of reducing the precision value from six, 32 to 16. And we suddenly saw a drop of say 50% of our entire system. Of course, it hits the, the overall quality of the system, but that's marginal as compared to how much we are actually storing. So instead of storing floats as 32-bit floats, we can store them as 16-bit single precision floats, but we can only do that when you can actually compress on values based on those. And 
Kiwi actually, since it was built in-house for our index, we were able to do that. And it's really fascinating, like how quick it is, like how quickly it is to compile. Uh, and you can actually use it for your own use cases, which has a lot of reads. So what were the results when we actually implemented this system on top of our current system? So as I said, that it's in sync with the current system. And what we do is now we get much richer set of these candidate pages, which come from our index, because these are now matched on a semantic level rather than just a word to word match. Um, we can do this in real time. This means we can do it within 300 millisecond budget. And it takes like 10 to 15 milliseconds. And if it's on a cluster, it takes has like another one to two milliseconds of network cost. And this forms another clicks IR technique to, uh, to add on top of it. So if you remember clearly, when, once I said, a search was defined as a problem as recall step and a ranking step. So in the recall step, we got like five to seven percent additional pages, which were like actually more relevant to the query. And that was the improvement which we saw like drastically. Uh, when we just implemented the system uh, and just like added these pages and allowed our current ranking to take care of it, uh, it sort of brought 0.5 to 1% improvement in just the final results that we see on the, on the browser. Uh, we then worked on the ranking part of it uh, and sort of used these features that actually come out on, uh, from query embeddings. The system is called query embeddings. And utilize this in the ranking itself. So now the ranking signal for query embeddings is also added to the final ranking. And we improved uh, the first three results up to a 4% on our goal data sets. And as I said, since we are in three different countries, we were able to scale it up to three different countries. This means three different languages. And the system is now scalable to even go further. So, but this is not the only thing that we did. So currently what we are doing is even sort of say significantly different is we want to replace annoy. So after all the, all the stories behind annoy, what we found out is we are growing too quickly. We have a lot many queries with uh, Mozilla and uh, Ghostry on board. We will have a lot of users and we want to be as scalable as possible as much as we can. And to do that, we want to focus on having a replacement which sort of focuses on efficient storage of vectors and also the nearest neighbor model, which learns on top of it with low latency lookups and with high accuracy. Now, these are very big terms, but if you say what could be the proposed features would be, we want to build our in index incrementally. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that, say, if I have an index which I've built already and a new query comes, I just want to add it to the current index. So I know it actually doesn't support it at the moment. Uh, I want to memory map the model so that this means um, the model remains on the disk and it doesn't consume all my RAM in general. I want to store these vectors slightly differently. And this is something which we did an experiment again, uh, where we actually say, okay, can we normalize these vectors by just storing them as like an integer between minus 100 to 100? So this allows us to instead allocate all the space that we store for each of these vector uh, dimensions in floats down to integer eight, which is another reduction in the factor of two. And this is the vector level approximation that we can do. You can also do efficient sharding again, uh, based on clustering techniques. Uh, reduce the training time, so reduce it down from six days to like say one day. Uh, or can you use multi-core architecture because Anoy is using just single process, single core. And can you distribute this training? Can you do something called product quantization, which we actually learned is something which companies like Facebook and Yahoo have actually proposed. So we looked at these external projects, NMSLib, Face, and LobQ. Face is from Facebook Research, and LobQ is from Yahoo, which uses product quantization techniques. And Facebook uses it for its uh, the similarity of images, uh, which you do. Um, and then we actually developed some internal projects which sort of use these features in part. So uh, the first version that we came up was MAN, which is Massively Approximate Nearest Neighbors, which was written in Python. It was super slow. So we thought, OK, let's, let's use Rust uh, to like, speed it up. So it's called Rustman. And then we have another version, which is called PanSearch, which sort of builds a search engine on top of it. So that's one of the things that we are working on now. The other thing, we want to actually go with like deeper models. Uh, we, we wanted to explore one model, which actually is significant, and we can actually utilize it for different problems. And it's called DSSM, or Deep Structured Semantic Models. It's a work done by Microsoft Research, and I can give you a small overview of how this works. So let's say I have a query and documents, say D1, D2, D3, as my inputs. I actually want to know, given a query document pair, I want to maximize the probability at the end that they both are similar, or they both are, say, correspondingly 
correct for each other. Now, if I have uh, this sort of a model, which can give me this similarity between two sentence pairs, I can successfully say that, okay, given any query, query queries, uh, I can actually say these queries are similar. Or given any query document pair, this document is more similar than the other document. So now I'm, I'm projecting a query with the document. That, that could be, say, the first result that you see in a search engine with the second one. And the first document is more relevant or is more similar than the second one. Or do you want to project, just in a noise contrastive estimation way, this correct document is more correct than all the noisy documents that I see. And through this model, you can learn this. And if you see the application areas of this particular model that you learn, you can see it in search ranking, you can see it in ad selection, you can see it in contextual entity search, question answering, uh, knowledge inference, image captioning, machine translation. So it's a really powerful model which works with many applications. And where the learning actually happens is at two steps. So first is, uh, say in your, in your bottom layer, which is word sequence, you just have word sequences in general. So for each query and each document, you have sequence of words, that's your initial layer. But then, since the words could be a lot, you can, have, you can have this problem of, say, millions of words. You want to reduce them down to some representation of those words, which could be, say, more compact. So the initial work was done using letter trigrams, which means like uh, these three character sequences within the word, and using those as representation. This is represented in the word hashing layer. Um, and then you have these learning layers, which was, say, used were like convolutional neural uh, layers, which were there to learn these representation over these contextual sequences. And again, the max pooling layer just picks the maximum probabilities out of those layers to get this final semantic layer where the actual representation of either the query or the document is learned. So if you have, again, two vectors of 128 dimensions, and I can get a cosine similarity, I can say, okay, this document is actually more similar to the query than in question. And if you do this, you have like say D plus, which is like the positive document and all the other negative documents. I can always project the query much closer to the positive documents and much away from the negative ones. And if you train this model across all your data sets, uh, you can actually get this representation in a very holistic manner. What we found out, we can actually do it even better. Uh, we, and this, this of course was done like say two or three years ago. So the work that has come recently has actually allowed us to go faster. So we found like there are some places where we can optimize this model. The, the first thing is how to get a better word hashing layer. So even when you have letter trigrams, your vocabulary size could grow. So if you have a lot of say foreign language text and you also have to like compute them as word representations, you might end up with a huge vocabulary even at a trigram level. So Google has a work which they released recently called Sentence Piece, uh, which actually is a very high level unsupervised text tokenizer and detokenizer. What it allows you to do is it sort of learns what should be the right segment where I could break a word. So if I know that the word face could actually be broken down at PH and then ASE, so I now, uh, instead of like just learning a trigram representation, I learn a bigram, a bi bigram on a character level and trigram on a character level. And if you learn it over your entire corpus, you can actually say, okay, these suffixes happen a lot, these prefixes happen a lot, and just learn them. And what it allows you to do is like, you can get a vocabulary of fixed size. So say your vocabulary size becomes say 32,000 or 64,000 instead of say 10 million. Why is this useful is once you're actually using GPUs and GPUs have very limited memory and you are stacking your layers because the deeper you go, at times it does better, at times it doesn't. Uh, but the deeper you go, you can actually learn more meaningful information. And given your initial set is say a big document could be like your entire web page and all text in it it could become really, really huge. You can just allocate the memory that you want to use on the GPU, knowing that it, is, it will be this big. So if you are using 32,000 as your vocabulary size, multiplied by 400, that would be the size of your initial word embedding, you have a fixed value of how much memory you have to allocate just for the embedding layer using this vocabulary size. And this is very important because as, as you'll see in practical problems with uh, like deploying large scale deep learning models is, GPU memory, because no matter how many layers you have, it's highly limited to how much GPU memory you have. And this is what you have to deal with. So you want to optimize it as much as possible. Uh, by the way, sentence piece is actually used for the zero shot translation system um, uh, by Google, um, where they actually found out that if you have a language pair, say language A to B, and translation from it, and language B to C, and you have data for it, 
you can actually learn a system where it automatically learns how to translate from, say, language A to C without giving it any initial data. So it learns an internal representation. But since they're dealing with multiple language pairs, they cannot learn it over words. So they use the segmentation model for that. We also found out that there are some different uh, sort of optimization on the layers itself. So instead of using a CNN or an LSTM, which is the convolutional neural network on an LSTM, which is long and short term memory network, we can use something called quasi RNN. It's work done by Metamine. It claims to be 5 to 7% faster to train, which sort of is the best of both worlds of uh, CNN and an LSTM. And you should, you should try to use that. Um, and then you can actually train different kinds of models. You can train query query similarity models, query document similarity models, or query rank document similarity models. And we actually still exploring this uh, in different ways. Um, and yeah, trying to optimize it as much as you can. But one of the practical problems with having big, deep models, and if you are working with the, such models and or you want to do that, is the problem of scale again. A scale, this means like if you want deep learning to work, one, you need a large data set and you need large data set with diversity. But not only that, even if you have the data set, for in case we do, you need an infrastructure which can actually handle that data set. So what we actually had to do was set up our own deep learning infrastructure. And we thought that TensorFlow was one of the best candidates for this. Um, so we are using something called a Dockerized TensorFlow, uh, which is running on K80 GPUs on AWS. And we are orchestrating this Docker containers through Kubernetes. Uh, again, they form this master-slave distributed systems concept, uh, where you have a parameter server, and then you have workers, where workers actually do the actual computation. And once the batch finishes, the updates are actually sent back to the master. And then the averages are con like sort of computed. So what you actually can get is if you have, say, several of these Docker worker containers, you can actually shard your data sets across those containers and then learn in parallel uh, across each of these shards. And then the parameter servers just computes the average either in a synchronous way or an asynchronous way. So with synchronous and asynchronous would be like if I have 10 workers and those 10 workers are computing on their batch of data and they send the results back to parameter server. So parameter server can actually wait for either 10 of them and then do an update by sort of summing them up and averaging them or can do them as soon as they arrive. So if the work of one finishes, it can just update the current values on the parameter server. And when the next worker wants to ask new values, it can just give those at whatever that is present. So there are researches where some people have claimed sync does better, async does better, uh, but it, it completely depends on your application and your data. And again, once you actually want to use uh, Kubernetes and TensorFlow in a distributed setting, you have to make changes to your script because you then have the system uh, luckily for us, with TensorFlow 1.2, which is the most recent version, which was sort of announced at Google I.O., uh, they now have more higher level APIs, say Keras integration or Estimator API, with a class called ex Experiments, which sort of, uh, sort of abstracts this whole logic out much clearly. So it now becomes very easy to experiment on a distributed cluster, especially if you have self-hosted it. You might not even need a Kubernetes cluster because you can just specify, OK, this IP address is my master node, and this one is my worker node. And you can run a distributed training application over your large data sets. The only problem is if, you have, if your data set is too large and you're using machines which change over time, uh, then you actually have to worry about how do you remember or how do you remember this mapping of masters and workers. Uh, it's a work done by my colleague, Fahim, and uh, I really thank him for it because it required a lot of work. Um, and then we also found out that once you have actually learned a model, uh, you cannot just use that and deploy into production using the core TensorFlow library because it's too slow. And as I said, latency is a huge problem. So luckily, again, TensorFlow has this framework called TensorFlow Serving, which is like a C++-based server to deploy your models. So the way they actually serve this is when you train, it trains in a common format called saved model. And it's sort of a model, uh, sort of your cluster, spe uh, the specification of your graph and the weights that it learns. And the TensorFlow serving server library actually is capable enough to learn or to sort of understand the same parameters from the saved model class. So once you have a saved model with all the weights and all the model definition, the serving class can just read from it and using the same input output functionalities, you can either do a classification, regression, or any sort of a score based uh, model inference. And this is super fast because instead of loading the entire graph in memory, 
the serving layer will just look at, okay, what I have to compute within this model to give you results as fast as possible. Now, if you're doing, say, image recognition and you want to do this, like, say, in a self-driving car where you see, like, it's at every frame you get, uh, like, a different image and you want to get, say, some information out of it, you have to do it very, very quickly. And usually all the work currently which is done is actually on inferencing so that how can you inference as fast as possible. So, yeah, TensorFlow serving for deploying models in production. So I'll just conclude uh, by what I just said, that we have query embeddings which is in place, and you can actually experiment this because uh, you can train these word vectors on a CPU on a large uh, data set, um, and they actually help us to re improve recall and ranking. Uh, we're actually really looking forward to dwell deeper into it. Uh, we want to scale up uh, clicks search into different countries, um, and with that, the challenge comes of like also different languages. Say Polish is very hard, I, I understood that. <laughs> And then you have, uh, of course, distributed training using uh, Kubernetes and TensorFlow. We want to replace Annoy so that we can scale because we want to grow, so um, we will have to be like scalable. Of course, document vectors and DSSM is something which we want to improve our search system uh, using this model. Last but not the least, um, I'll just finish with this quote, uh, which was given by John Rupert Fitt in 1957, where he actually said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps which means the, the context of the word will define what is the meaning of the word. So Mikolov in 2013 gave this model of word to vec to the world, uh, which actually works exactly on the same principle. But the core ideas are like much, much, say, historically relevant. So with that, I'll say thank you, and we'll open up to questions. And uh, I have my email as ankitaclicks.com and my Twitter as code key. And the slides are actually available at uh, bit.ly slash deepcodeeurope. Uh, so if you're interested, like do write to me, do look at the slides. Thank you.